Thank you, Antonin. Isaac's got himself marked remote. Good job, Isaac. <laughs> See if I can find everybody. Wow, it's been well. What did you guys think of Kelly and Chris? Yeah. Did you like that? It's a good way to spend your time. They're really, I really enjoyed having them. I like meeting Chris. I thought Chris got hugely motivated by talking to you guys, and he was really surprised by that. So yay, he should be a guest speaker in the future. I was excited. <laughs> Matt, the one that we were missing out on, their boss, the reason he has this awesome Australian accent, and so I think that's why he's just such a good manager because you could just sit and listen to him talk for as long as you need to because he just has that awesome accent. So I was that he had a lot of um, illness in his family, unfortunately, through things these past few months. So that's too bad. Well, we've got some slot machines to see, I see. Looks like we've got some excellent ones out there. I've just been kind of trying to not look at them. I didn't get to see your sports interfaces and all of that stuff last week because our guest speakers ran long. Actually, they just took forever getting started, but that's okay. That's, I think that was more important. But if you do have something like that you'd really like to share about your sports interface or your sports team, Jackie's back there going, no, no. Oh, no, I prefer the sports one. <laughs> <laughs> you prefer the sports one's much more pretty. <laughs> well, then show, show us it. Pick whichever one you would like to show us. That's fine because we have the both of them. Let's keep it short and sweet. Go ahead and get your application up so that you're ready to share right away. Um, you know, you want to show it executing, if it's executing, and then show us your code real quick. But let's move real quick and then we can get on to all of our other stuff while our paper out here is sanitary. So how shall we go? We always start at the beginning of the article. Let's start back with Jackie and Erin. Aaron's looking over the top of the monitor. Is it being persnickety? Yeah, you might have to start at the front. <laughs> <laughs> Just being honest. <laughs> That's all right. We'll, we'll skip them. <laughs> I'm going to drink a coffee. Let's go up here to the front because you guys always start us off so well. Mm -hmm. okay. <laughs> All righty. Um, good morning, everyone. Um, oh. I'm just going to keep it short and sweet. Um, I guess we'll start with just showing it off. Um, here's my slot machine. There it is, slotting away. Um, so basically, the only thing that will, um, the only thing I think is really sets this apart is the spinning animation that I have. And uh, basically, I got that to work by 
setting up a timer. So there's like an outer timer for, uh, oh, okay, there's an inner timer for the, each individual slot, which spins every, you know, like 10 times a second or whatever. And uh, an outer timer that controls every slot that lasts for two seconds. So the effect is every single image just updates a ton for two seconds. So it kind of like, it seems like it's spinning, I guess. But it's actually super cool. <laughs> but it's also really, really hard. Like you almost never get three of a kind. And I guess I never get two of a kind either. I hope this isn't a bug. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I should have won one dollar by now, at least. Maybe it's really on like really there going go. to the casino. There you go. Two lemons, one dollar. <laughs> I'm rich. And basically you'll never see three of a kind. Like I really like it'll take like five minutes to get like any sort of money at all. But you would win ten dollars if you did. Because <laughs> it's so unusual. It's really rare. It's, it's pretty great. Let's see your random stuff and see if it looks like uh, okay. kosher. I okay, so um yeah, this took a little bit of explaining. So to count um, if you've won or not, basically make a temporary list with the index number of the, uh, the fruit type kind. Um, and in that temporary list, you count the distinct, the number of distinct um, like numbers, I guess. So if you have three distinct numbers, that would like represent like cherry, banana, grape, or whatever. So that's no matches. If you have uh, two distinct, say cherry, cherry, apple, that's two matches. So you got two. And if it's, uh, what is it, one distinct, that's all cherries, you win. So that's kind of just my hacky way of figuring out if you won or not. Um, I don't know. I like the spin animation. <laughs> I think that's kind of cool. I think that's awesome. I'm yeah. not sure I trust your distinct code if you're never ever <laughs> winning. <laughs> no, I, I, mean, I've seen I like the code, I just don't know. <laughs> okay, you know what? If we've got two minutes to spare, <laughs> we could put it in debug. You know what? And make sure that it, it really. I'll win, I swear. I just, I just won't win. <laughs> I'm sure you will. <laughs> a true gambler, a true gambler. I will win. <laughs> just let me play more. Okay, I don't want to you guys. So, I guess that's all for me. It looks beautiful. Any questions before he disconnects? Sorry, Grant. That's okay. Good. Yay. Okay, next one. Next of you, please. Wait, so mine's, mine's not as fancy as that was. Uh, but I have, a, I have a list for the slots. Uh, I've made a, a counter system and a, uh, like a slot opening for each of the slots so that when I call for the, when I call for the spin, it will give me the random number generator. And Based on the slot counter, I'll put it into one of the slot numbers so that I have a, a easier time of checking uh, if the slot was a winning number or not. Okay. Can't see it. Oh, it's oh, it's part of the Share everything. Share everything. Not just check. There you go. Nice. See, here's win, here's win. I'm going to be my spins and my slot images. <laughs> Thank you. 
<laughs> nice and simple. Any questions? Looks good. Yay. Right, let's go to the next row then. Great code. There we go. Okay. Okay. So I I set it up to where you can um, nice. You can look at the picture I guess. I've seen this actual game at Skills USA event when the recruiters are there. <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I originally I originally did this in uh, in PowerPoint and then I was thinking, well, why don't I just transfer it over and do some more? Nice. Uh, the PowerPoint one was, was funnier and sharpier, but uh, so anyway, it does random images. Some of the some of the, some of the things that I that I had fun making were trying to find PNG files to, to give the transparency background. Really good. Um, yeah. You're bored. Yeah. <laughs> I love it. But, uh, it it should be about like one. Randomly, about one in a uh, hundred and thirty, you can get a big win. Uh, when I when I had only ten ten images, it was right there. You go. Woo! Uh, Lots of winning going on here today. Yay! And that looks really yeah. cool. <clears throat> anyway, going into uh, <laughs> the code, let's see. So I I got three classes. I did. Uh, one for you know that it generates all the quick events. One for the, the picture boxes that it's that it's pulling from, and then uh, how it's pulling everything. Let's see some of the the more interesting stuff is I took everything out of the load event. I threw it into the the button so that it loads everything up to be quick. Um, here is the loop that decides. Uh, when is not, and that's based off of the string, off of the labels, and we'll get to that in a second of the random nature. And um, this is this is the wild loop to generate the image spin. So I tried the timer, and I just I didn't have as good of luck with that, so I just went with the wild loop. And it no, that's neat. Uh huh. It works. And I had it at one point where one would stop different times, but it kind of generated some different. Problems, you know, like 100, 300, 800, which was interesting, but like I said, it came with its own drama. So I, I oh, that's it. the neat. Um, reset button, uh, and then there's the, the form load basically loads everything up. Moving over to the picture boxes. Um, that's really the guts of it drawing the picture boxes on a label. Very nice. And for the random images, I've got 13 images, so it generates the number, two different switches, uh, one that grabs the image, and then the other one that grabs the text, and going back over here to bring it full circle. Um, these, these are the, the selection statements that based off of the text in the label is, is where it gives you the win or the big win, and to try again. So. There you go. Very nice. Questions? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Really good. Thank you, Archie. I like it. And I have to make up for your time, but it's going to take a while. So. 
Well, I had uh, done this uh, project solution the last uh, class that I took, so I kind of changed it up. Uh, basically, on this one, I took one image. And I, and I split it up into two single images. And I did that with a class called slot image, basically. And so if I called it in to get an image, it basically gave the X and Y's uh, of where the image is in, uh, in the other image, in the, in the main image. And then I basically took the one image and I said, hey, cut a rectangle out of it at that X and Y location. And that's how I got each Can individual. Can you stripe mapper there? That's pretty good. <laughs> instead of doing multiple images. So I had a class for that called slot, slot image. And then my, I have a class called slot roller, which then takes and creates three list for my three different uh, rollers and takes all those images and shoves them in there randomly basically into three different li you know list one random 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 basically and then if that wasn't enough I, I wrote a little <laughs> shuffle to shuffle it a little bit more so that they were truly random in there so that's my each individual like list for my images And then on my form, basically, I uh, I create the positions for the three. Now this is a little weird because I I mean might actually roll instead of flipping images like the gentleman up in front or part I I actually made it roll. So, which was a little really neat. And I made it roll from the bottom up mm -hmm. <laughs> instead of the top down. And I tricked it out, and I'll show you how I tricked it out. So, basically, <laughs> if you go into the design and you look at, at my image, I've got like panels over it. Okay. And I faked it out because I have I, I stacked my images below and I hit them. Okay. And then when you play, they actually roll up from the bottom. Oh, very neat. Okay. So I actually have static X positions. And then I move my Y positions up. And if my Y position hits the bottom of the image hits the the top gray. 
then I just basically move it back down to the second position I keep moving it. Right, so I just basically keep moving the images. You know, one, one comes off the page, I move that image down below again underneath the head and I keep move it up again. Very nice. Basically. So that was kind of fun to do. But it got a little messy here. I tried to put these off into methods like this, mm -hmm. but actually, <laughs> it actually like uh, uh, was really, really slow. <laughs> like the images, they would move really, really slow when I moved it to, to images or methods, simple methods. Huh. Was one of them. I don't know why, but when I put them in line like this, Basically, so this is like the first one. I check the position, and so then I move it back, right? Like I said. Uh, let's see what else. Very uh, neat. Uh, so then I just have a simple uh, check winning, basically at the end of, end of my roll, and I've got in my classes. I basically have an icon, like property that I can check. For my images when I sent it. So I sent, you know, I sent the roller position basically to, I haven't hit a three of a kind, but I do hit two of a kinds quite uh, closely. And also, one other note, uh, I, I did Pences and Lear. <laughs> Great because that's what the image you, you, had. Very <laughs> good, very good. It's so literal. Good job. <laughs> and that's it. That's me. Yay, that was really nice. <laughs> interesting, interesting. <laughs> yeah, do you guys have any? <laughs> um, we'll see. Isaac might have one right. too. We'll so see. this is my code. Uh, I just have a slots class for like the main application and then a real class for each individual picture uh, just to kind of see it working. It starts with like a default slot image uh, and then you click play. I don't have it scrolling. Um, That's okay. It looks really in. good. And, uh, yep. So it does that and then the quick button works. Um, but basically the way that I have it working is in the real class. Um, it has all of the information for loading up a new picture box. Um, and then when it loads up a new, when it loads up a new reel, it sends a single character uh, back to the slots and it generates a three character long key. And so I just check if any of the three characters uh, match here. Um, so match two. Yeah. So if so it just checks the string because a string is basically an array of characters. So I just check the individual characters inside of the string to see if they match. And if they do, uh, I put match two and match three into their own methods in case, like, you know, I wanted to get fancy with it, throw nice. somebody around or something. Mm -hmm. um, but I didn't end up doing that because it got kind of late. Um, Good organization, though. Yeah. And that's about it. It just sends the key and then checks for a match. Very nice. Yep. Okay. That's good. Thank you. Woohoo! So I have about the same thing. <clears throat> you just pull and it just puts images on there. There's a win, I guess. And then the code is pretty basic, actually. So I made a uh, class called Roots, a little bit. And I just made a constructor with any uh, properties. Ethan, can you zoom in a little bit? Control oh, yeah, scrollers. Control scroll should. Yay. Thank you. Yeah, so properties and uh, constructors and stuff. And then I uh, make them over here. So you can just add the roots and you can add as many as you want. All you have to do is change the 
random number and uh, another three that you want to add more. It's pretty basic, so but it's pretty efficient in my regards. But um, so when you click the button, it creates the random numbers, and so it goes to the file from uh, and it gets the root random number right here the random number that's been pulled and goes to the array and finds that root source that was up here. And so the text also does the same thing. Um, and if it's just two of a kind, when cash plus uh, 10 cents, it says it to just 10 cents cash value. And then it's this one for a dollar if you do two of a kind. And then that's about it. Super simple. Now, am I going to be able to run that on my computer? You have to change the source code for the images. Am I going to be able to run that on my computer? No. no. Those need to be in your resources folder. So never, ever, ever, ever submit something where you are looking at. And I apologize, Ethan, because I am just wanting to make this point to everybody because as we move through this semester, this will be a lot more important when we get to database things and things like that. But whenever we're looking at any sort of file that we're going to put in TFS, make sure you don't have an absolute path name like this anywhere in your code because that'll cause trouble when we go to another computer. So go ahead and fix that before you turn it in because otherwise it's a deduction because I won't be able to test it. But we want to always be going off that resources folder. When we get to our databases and we're looking at databases, there will be times that you guys might have to submit your database file to me in Canvas so that I can get to it, so that I can load it. But with it this way, it wouldn't be a matter of me changing it to look at my directory. These images won't get uploaded to TFS for Ethan because they're not part of the resources of this project. So I wouldn't be able to run it. So we wanna always make sure that we're never doing a direct path like that. So thank you so much for letting me show everybody because that's something that gets a lot of people. And I can say it in class as we're coding, but it, it still just doesn't always get in there sometimes as much as when you're actually seeing it. Okay, I love it. I think it's nice and simple. It came out really good. Mm -hmm. So give him a hand. Yay. <laughs> Isaac, did you have a chance to create anything? He's been busy. Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay, yeah, I definitely did. Uh, I made some mistakes that I wasn't able to fix in time, but it does work. <laughs> I can get it open just one second. Okay. Okay, so I'm gonna get in Solution Explorer. But this is my code. This is for my class that holds my slot machine images. So what it does is it has a constructor and it basically takes a integer and then it takes that integer and generates a random value, which will determine what image to put on it. And let me go to the slot machine form. Okay. And here's my main code. So, um, I have two different arrays to hold like the images and the individual classes. I kind of wanted to set my slot machine images to use the picture box form, but since I set up my code in a way where the classes were separated by project, and since I declared this bomb project as just a class and this top one as a form, I had troubles trying to access a form namespace and it wouldn't let me do it and I didn't know how to quite fix that so I decided just to do two arrays for this particular project. So it'll start up two different arrays and then it'll 
just generate the code. And what I would do to set the image is, since I wasn't able to import the picture box, uh, it sets the images this way. Like it uses, it's kind of redundant to me to use two switch cases, but since I couldn't get the namespace to work, I decided this would be the best bet for now. And on my play button to check if in my slot, in my list, I mean, it would just check if it had the same string, which I didn't quite like this. I liked from the project earlier, the guy that used distinct to check the list. Like, I thought that was really cool. I didn't really like this code I made here, but it does work. And I'll just run the program now. Do, 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 do. Okay. There we go. <laughs> and just keep spamming it until you make money because this doesn't take any currency. It won, I think. <laughs> yeah. That's my project. Yeah. It's that. Towards the back of the room, he's got something to show us back there. So somebody will help you with that. So I have cases as one of my class. Uh, my plan was to have these variables. Mm -hmm. Put them in into cases that would give me the results. And then I'll just put that at the end. Okay, here's the logic. Slot machine. So one, two, three, three other matches I want to do. And then well, nothing. Oh, that looks really close. So it's just your images, really. Mm -hmm. And three hundred, but once it reaches zero, the button goes away. Looks good, just this problem with the images. Okie dokie, so when I first got in here, my design was really messed up. It was perfect, I pulled my using model on it, so I had to uh, uh, deal with it. So, let's see, let's go over my code first. So first up, I use an array and a list, right? The list, I defined it dynamically, but the array is an array of all my images, and so I can just call their index in order to uh, change the image. So that would fix your problem, Don, wouldn't it? If you created that, I think that would be a good thing to try to copy. Or any late. <laughs> yeah, okay, I can find it. I'm going to after that. I can go through that. Okay. Right. Show them how to do that. That'd be awesome. Thank right. you, Aaron. So, first up is my form events. I have two. I have the form load, right? 
And so uh, I set some generic um, amounts uh, and change some labels. And then I um, generate my pictures and I add them to my slot array, which is a uh, slot list. Sorry. So then if we come back here to my methods and open up my generate, it's kind of what we did in class the other day. Uh, it, it actually copied and pasted in this code. So I guess it's plagiarism on my own code or our combined class code. Um, Okay. Using so the resource you have. Three images, right? And then when I click my spin button, here's the code. If you have no money, it's going to say you're out of money. Go to message box. If you don't spin, it's going to tell you to place a bit else. It's going to call my spin method. Now come down here to my spin method. Um, it creates an array of editors, right? And then that array is going to be defined. I'm by my change slots method. So let's come down here to change slots. So it's going to disable my spin button so you can't just spam that. Um, it instantiates a random class. And then um, the uh, int is equal to rand.spin. So what I had done, if you look to my right here on my solution explorer, I have random dot, a random slot.cs. I did some form inheritance um, on the random class and added a new random method called spin. Um, and so it, this right here is what defines what a win is. Uh, it, it's what changes the pictures and also gives you the odds of winning here. And your odds of winning a jackpot is one out of a thousand. So I don't think we're going to see one today. But then the odds of winning a two, like, like a match, is 10%. Um, and then otherwise, you're going to knock anything. And so um, not only is it, does it do these odds, it also spins over and over until it gets a spin that matches that in each um, slot. So it, if it decides that you're going to win, then it's going to just keep spinning until it gets a win. Nice. Or if you, if you get a match, we'll keep spinning until you get a match. <laughs> He's been to the casino. <laughs> so then we come back to our slot machine code. It catches those values. Not only does it change the images down here, but it also returns that integer value, which is then used in my check win function. So it returns the nums, which is that integer value. I already changed the images um, at the slot. Uh, just a second. Uh, here in the uh, picture box slot class, where it changes the images, and it returns that number back to this spin class, uh, spin method, right? And then it awaits for an exponential amount of time. Um, and so that gives us the, the where it files two different spins. And, and then it does our check when, and then it can um, check some stuff to see if you have money still, and set some after it. And then check when, um, if you have a jackpot. So, so real quick, I use the I numeral. It, I kept it up in today. And I find distinct values in my integer array. So instead of having to look through each one of the loop or whatever, C sharp has something that did automatically for me. And so if I only have one distinct number, I get a jackpot, two, you have a two, uh, um, you have a match. And if I, have, if I have three distinct numbers, then you don't win anything. Okay, so enough talking. Let's see this in action. So then I have to place a bid, otherwise I can't spin. So let's do 10 bucks. We're going to do hopefully 10 spins here. Let me just hold that. So it just starts slowing down as you get closer to whatever spin it is. Yay, we won 50 bucks. And then, yeah, it takes forever to do the spins though. So uh, I don't think we can do 13 spins now. But yeah, there's my project. Very nice. Mm -hmm. Very nice. <laughs> Who wants to go next? I can go. <laughs> You're okay. It's just hard to follow Aaron. <laughs> so good. Oh, I know it. 
hard to follow a lot of you. Everybody says that they could tell. Can you guys see that? Yeah. So this isn't the slot machine. This is this sports interface. And the reason I'm saying this is because I had a blast doing this, and I'm so proud of it. <laughs> so let me run it. I think the hardest thing I had with this, though, was the I did. Because I kept getting lost at where I was putting stuff and having to find where it was to make sure it worked. But it did. Um, I think this thing kind of where did it go? It was right here with learning in the other classes how to update those so that they also had their individual things that they print out on the form. Like how cheer had something different on their line and how soccer had something different on their line. Um, it was the most rewarding, but it was the most difficult for me to Trying to get it together, but it did. And it works. There's the candle band. So many pieces that you guys had to fit together. Mm -hmm. There really, really are a lot. So. When I got my, uh, got my assignment part over here, I kind of had a similar issue um, where when I brought it over, uh, it worked fine on my computer, and then I bring it over here, and it just, everything kind of messes up on me. It wouldn't let me put the same thing mark the way, which I didn't have. Tori, was it on a flash drive by any chance? What's that? Did you have it on a flash drive by any chance? No, I uh, had the, uh, the code sent. I sent it to myself through like an email, I think so. Through an email? Well, yeah. go ahead and show everybody what it's done, if you would, because it could happen to anybody, and we'll try to figure out what the deal is. Yeah, but so unfortunately, uh, because of it, the code doesn't work. <laughs> um, for some reason, it, it kept, it, when it would do the, the whole mark of the web, I was like, okay, I got that out of the way. And then it kept giving me file not found errors, and it just, I was like, Ooh. So can you go bring up File Explorer and show everybody where that set that property setting is that you had to change? So open File Explorer. Um, outside of yeah. Open folder in File Explorer. There you go. In order to what? If you have problems with it to fix it, you go into properties and underneath the attributes, it'll have like this. Yeah, so we're not seeing it. Oh, sorry. I thought I showed it's okay. It. it popped up and then it just disappeared. But um, underneath the attributes, it'll have security down the bottom and there'll be a little box right here to check. You want to click that and apply and then hit okay. I have to deal with every single file. Well, how much is that? I'll say that's the mark of the web. It's like been marked by the like in, is it these file or something? Yeah. But it happens because of the security protection that's on these computers or whatever computer you're trying to use a file on. And if the file was created on a different computer, and this computer is sure of that, it can mark it like that and say that it's a suspicious file. So it'll happen like if you create if you create a complete project on a flash drive and bring the flash drive in and plug it in, it can all get marked like that. Or if you email yourself something. So that's another reason that we're forced to use TFS. So TFS evil but prevents problems like this that Windows is getting more and more protective of files from an unknown source. So she'll be able to submit it from home and it won't be any problem. It's just not going to be cooperating here because of the way the virus scanning stuff is marking it and disabling things. So our environment can always come out and get us. Be afraid. 
<laughs> Tell her thank you for telling you about the evil mark of the web. Yay. <laughs> it is really bad. back there in the corner. Staring. Okay. Okay. 
see what I've got here. Jump everywhere. Their test. They had some good range of scores. Yeah, for our exam. The one we just took. Yep. And so there are a couple of questions that I changed the correct answer for like Friday afternoon, is that right? And so depending on when you took the exam, you might have gotten counted wrong on a couple and I fixed those and I'll show you which ones they were so that you know because all of these came from an MTA exam practice exam and I wanted you to just see what it's like and you guys just did a great job. The passing score for the MTA exam, remember, is 70%. Anything 70% and above is a passing score. Computer tests, computer multiple choice tests, all computer tests are historically difficult. So anything above a 70% is considered good, not just average in my mind. <laughs> Some of these questions are really worded interestingly also. So let's see which ones they changed. Oh, this one. You're developing a C-sharp application. You need to decide whether to declare a class member is static. Which of the following statements is true about static members of a class? And I think that only one copy of a static field is shared by all instances of a class is correct. But the static keyword is used to declare members that do not belong to individual objects that to, it, to a class itself is more correct, if that makes sense. So when we're looking at the MTA exam, that can be the only thing that can make it like difficult, is there can be multiple correct answers that they're looking for the most accurate, most correct answer. So really good, just a little bit of difference, kind of goes along with some of those old quiz taking rules of choosing the answer that's the longest, most specific, if you're in a situation like that. I think that's the hardest part of the MTA exam is that some questions will have multiple correct answers and you have to pick the most correct. Now, when we get into the different types of classes, here's one that costs a lot of people. So let's take a look at it. We have a class named Sphere that's derived from the shape class. Here's our shape class. Our shape class has a virtual method named area. So if I have a virtual method, do I have to override it? Can I override it? Yes. Okay, so it would, if it's abstract, I have to, but if it's virtual, I just can. Okay, then the area method in the shape class should provide new functionality, but also hide the shape class implementation of the area method. They just mean it should override it. So let's see, why was it hard? Everybody said A. Oh, I see why. So what is that new keyword? What does that mean? It hides it, right? It hides it in addition to just overriding it. So that's like something that if we look, we're not going to see that information in a lot of places. So it's painful to, to go through an exam or a quiz like this and say, what? I've not seen that. But some of this really specific, in-depth kinds of things that's the best way for you to remember it, right? To experience a little bit of pain is the only way to remember it because we are not going to use this. This is not something that is really expounded upon in our material. So just being aware of it is going to help you so much on that exam, if that makes sense. Beautiful. 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 This one, everybody really did a good job. Any of these, do try. You know, if you want to just 
open up Visual Studio, try some of this code. So, really good, really good, really good. Here's the one. In this one, they say you are a C Sharp developer who is developing a Windows application. You develop a new class that must be accessible to all the code packaged in the same assembly. Even the classes that are in the same assembly but do not directly or indirectly inherit from this class must be able to access the code. Any code outside the assembly should not be able to access the new class. Which access modifier should you use to declare the new class? The exam had private is the correct answer. So if somebody, this person here, checks that because of the practice exam or something, send me an email and I'll give you those points. Because if you try it, or if you look at the documentation, internal is the correct answer. And I've seen that a lot on MTA exam practice material, but we're gonna go with what we see in reality happening is internal being the correct answer. We are not gonna go with the MTA practice test material. And this one, the rectangle. This one everybody needs to try. So the correct answer for this, I have a class named rectangle. I have a getter and a setter for two variables, length and width. When I instantiate a rectangle R1, I set the length and width to 20. Notice again, I'm using unusual syntax that we don't really use often. They can say, okay, I think I know what this is doing. They're not really ever trying to trick you they're trying to make sure that you understand unusual syntax along with the normal, because normal just isn't enough. <laughs> okay, then we say rectangle R2 is equal to rectangle R1. Pull out in memory. I have a memory location. And I have a length, whatever, whatever we said it was, whatever we say it was, 10 and 20. So this is a rectangle. And in memory, it's at location 1A cost, okay? And then I come along and I say, now I want to create a rectangle R2. R2 equals R1. Well, all I'm going to get is this pointer location. So they're both pointing to the exact same location in memory because of the way they were allocated. So if I change one of those properties, it doesn't matter whether I use R1 or R2, I'm addressing that same location in memory. So if I change the length, the output is gonna be that revised length. Does that make sense? So this one caused a lot of confusion, understandably so. So do try it. This is a really short amount of code to try to see how this works. And if you set it up in the debugger and step through it, then it'll really, really come home to you that we really just only have that one instance of a rectangle built in memory for this example. And we're just pointing to that same exact rectangle with both of those different names or identifiers. Okay, beautiful. So I'm super happy with everybody's scores. And if you look at your grades, your grades are just awesome. So, so we're finally gonna talk about some of those constructs and things that you guys have been using. No, don't protect me. <laughs> whenever the computer starts protecting me. I always struggle to be free. All right, so, I like these thin masks that they're falling on me. I've got to figure something out. The chapter that we're working with is about collections. And you guys all used all sorts of different collections in your application. So you've gone past what we looked at in class, which is normal and good. And we just want to kind of talk about some of these things. 
how these different collections work, how they work in all sorts of different programming languages. And we can look at this from lots of different aspects. So we're going to start out just kind of in a general talking about arrays overall. And one thing that we can talk about when we're talking about arrays or collections of data is complexity and runtime. When I used to work at Liggett and Platt in Carthage down the road, we used to have jokes about how when certain applications ran, the lights would get dim. That was because there were certain, certain applications that were written so poorly, they would suck all the power out of the building basically to run in that. Not really, but it felt like it. Those applications did not take into regard performance when they were creating their code. They created arrays and collections of things, and then they processed those arrays over and over and over and over without regard for performance. We didn't really think about what was going on. So we have to always think about performance because we can't afford for the lights to go dim. The systems programmer down there, at like when I worked there, um, we had a mainframe and mainframes use a lot of power. And I didn't even know it, but we had a water cooled mainframe and that means that it had a chiller unit and water would run through the chiller to get cooled off and then it would run under the computer, kind of like a water cooled PC, basically, that's where they got the idea. And so the chiller would keep the water cold and keep the, the mainframe cool. And Steve came up with this idea that instead of keeping the chiller in the same room as the mainframe, he was like, you know, we got this little room next door that we don't use for anything. Why don't we move the chiller out into that room and then we want to keep the chiller cool because it generated a lot of heat itself and keep cooling the water. And so they put it in this little teeny room and I don't know how much money he saved them, but the first month with the check they gave him for his special money saving endeavors, he bought a little car. So that worked out good, right? <laughs> Performance, man, that's what he was thinking about. He said, all these programmers are writing these programs to just keep this mainframe alive, just make it generate so much heat. But I can figure out a way to think outside of the box and take advantage of things and help it a little bit. So we want to always be thinking about that. How can we make performance better? Big O is, is a theory. It's, it's kind of like, I don't know what you call it. They say big O notation. It's just like a, a, an idea. It's a description of performance and complexity. So how complicated is an algorithm? How bad is it? Because big O is the worst case. Is this thing going to run for 75 hours? When I worked at Mutual of Omaha, there were programs, there were applications that ran for 75 hours. Don't, don't be surprised. And there were things that took 75 tapes. Yes, sir. Uh, I wrote a program once to brute force a classroom, and it took two weeks. Yeah. That was like 32 to the end. <laughs> did you find one? Did I you find it? it? Did it get it? Yeah. It, it did get it. <laughs> it did eventually get it. You have to have enough resources to sit there and run. So data. Aaron was doing some data mining there. When we're working with data, we have to realize that there are different structures that programmers over the years have developed and they've said these structures work well, they perform well. Whenever we're looking at it from a science standpoint, some of these data structures wouldn't even be something that we would discuss. There would be things that you would hear about when you go for your four year degree, when you take more advanced data courses and things, you might be exposed to those things. Or if you work on a software project with a lot of data, I like, you know, I like talking to my son at OU about the meteorolo meteorological standpoint of the data, because that gives me this understanding of working with huge massive quantities of constantly updating data that they have to worry about. So we have a lot of different points of view about data. When I worked at Mutual of Omaha, we didn't have constantly updating data like that, right? We would have every once in a while an insurance salesman would sell a policy. That's very different 
than sensors that are pulling in constantly updating pieces of information. So very different. No matter what, though, we want to understand that there's patterns that are involved in all of those different processings of data. So we don't want to overthink it and we don't want to reinvent the wheel. If I were going to so address, because I've gone back into the end times and I have to so now, which I wouldn't doubt in another few months, I'm going to use a pattern. I'm not going to just come up with something out of space, right? I'm going to use an existing pattern that's going to help me to create this thing that I don't know what I'm doing with, so I better have some place to start. So we always have patterns available to us for storing data and searching for data and sorting data. We saw with the interfaces for searching and sorting data that we could set things up in C sharp. We could kind of say, this is what this data structure is. This is how you sort it. So we, we know that we can take our data structures and use these patterns to massage our data and manipulate it into the right pattern. But sometimes we have data structures that are already existing that could help us with all sorts of different functions. So these are just give us more tools to use in our toolbox. So big O is the worst case. What is the worst thing you're gonna do to me running this program? Is it gonna run for 72 hours or is it going to have a constant runtime that's really, really fast because it only does one thing, one comparison? This is not really a realistic program, is it? But this is the simplest in big O theory. This is a constant runtime. This program will do one comparison. Compare A to B. We don't care how many variables it has, how many different things. It has a constant runtime. It's only going to compare one thing to another thing. We call it O to one. Now, that doesn't happen very often. Much more often, we could have a linear runtime. And a linear runtime is where we have an array. And in this array, we're going to compare something to every element in our array. So when we're running something like that, if our array or n is 100, we're going to do 100, well, 100 or 99 comparisons. If we're, if we're comparing the first thing in our array to every other item in our array, we'll do 99 comparisons. But if our array is 1,000, then we're going to do 999 comparisons. And if our array size is a million, how many comparisons are we going to do then? A lot. So whenever we're talking about a linear red fine, or O to the N, O on the order of N, or order N, the resources that are required are directly related to the size of our array, or the N, the number we're going to process. This is a linear runtime. It grows linearly. As I add elements, it's going to take longer. Now, a quadratic runtime. Let's say that <laughs> a quadratic runtime or order on O on the order of n squared or order n squared is where I'm going to basically compare every element to every other element in my array. So I'm going to compare element one to element two through 99. I'm going to compare element two to element one and then element three through 99. So as my array grows in size, my runtime requirements are going to grow quadratically. Right? That makes sense. So as I increase in size, I'm going to be doubling. Here's how they say it. Every doubling of the occurrence of n causes a quadratic increase in resource requirements. So this is something that could be a huge performance penalty. So we just talk about this a little bit. Somebody put it in the chat there. If you take the data structures class, if you're a CS degree person, I think they get into it a little bit more. There's some interesting information at Rob Bell's Big O intro. This is really some interesting stuff because what we're doing is we're just 
naming these performance issues, these performance things that we have to be concerned about as developers. So I think that's kind of neat. Okay, so one way that we might use an array is to search through an array. When we are looking at a data structure, like an array, and we want to do a search, we want to search for a specific element in our array. We can use a linear search. And a linear search is a predefined kind of algorithm that we can apply. Whenever we use a linear search, we can use it on a sorted or an unsorted array. We are going to be looking at each element in the array sequentially. So we're going to say, does item two match this one? Does item three match this one? And we want to make sure we know every single element in our array that matches. A linear search is super inefficient. If you guys have the PowerPoint, you can go to this website. If not, that's all right. You can just watch. It's not really hugely awesome. Maybe if it will load. Finally, awesome animation. This is from the Java textbook. Here we have this array. In this array, we just have a bunch of integers. You can see the integers are not in any certain order. They're just randomly out here in this array. If I do a linear search, I'm going to start at the beginning of the array. And in this animation, I'm looking for the number eight. So I'm going to start out with the first step and say, is index position zero's value equal to eight? Nope. So I'm going to step to the next one. Is the next array entry equal to eight? Nope. So as I step through, I finally find eight. So I can either be done, or you know we might continue on searching through the array to find additional occurrences. The animation doesn't show us doing that but we could very easily do that if that's what we needed to do. So this is a linear search. I'm just going from the beginning of the array, stepping across it step by step until I get to the end or until I get to the entry that I'm looking for. So linear search, very inefficient, bad, bad, bad. Binary search, ooh, much better, right? So what's a binary search? Binary search is, my array has to be in sorted order, but binary search is like, what's that one game from the Price is Right, the high-low game, have you seen it? Where Drew says, the price is between zero and a thousand. What do you get? And the intelligent player says, I get 500, Drew. And Drew says, Oh, you're low. It's actually higher. What do you guess now? And the intelligent player says, Oh, I guess 750, Drew. And Drew said, Oh, it's higher than that. And so the intelligent player again cuts that in half again and keeps making those guesses half, half, half until they find the right amount and they win the prize, right? The really dumb person, well, they go, Drew says it's between one and a thousand. What do you guess? And the dumb person goes, um, five. And Drew says, no. And they go, 12. And he, Drew says, no. And they don't win the prize because they're not doing a binary search. So a binary search is where you split what you have in half. Yes? I was going to say, Khan Academy has a really cool binary search game that uh, actually visually shows you. Who does? Uh, Khan Academy. I have oh, nice. Sure. Let's see it. So it's like this. You go like that. I'm just doing this just to show you guys how it works. I'm not actually. But every time you click something, it cuts it. Shows you what's left for you to look at. Right. Awesome. Thank you.
My dream is to be on the Price is Right someday, so you know, that's all the visual I need. <laughs> Let's look at the Liang one. It, they also have an awesome animation about binary searching. Come on, click there. It's not as good as the Khan Academy one. So I wonder why the interwebs are so exceedingly slow. I know mine at home are really bad. Do you think it has to do with them? Um, yeah, never mind. All that stuff. So my array has to be in order to do a binary search, because otherwise I can't cut things in half. Here I want the eight again. So I'm going to start in my first step will be to figure out what the midpoint is of the array. Then I'm going to compare that entry to the one I'm looking for. Is the one I'm looking for higher or lower? In our case, it's lower. So we'll just eliminate that whole top half of the array. And then we'll split it in half again and do our comparison. In this case, we're higher. So just like the Khan Academy one, we are slowly eliminating the different data. So it's a lot more efficient, but look at the difference in coding. A lot harder to code, right? So if you're doing the coding, man, you know, I mean, that linear search, ooh, that seems to work good, doesn't it? But a binary search is a lot more efficient. So our code can be impacted greatly. So what about sorting? We saw that we could do array.sort with C sharp, and then if we add it, I iterable, I can't say the right thing, then we can actually sort our classes, our structures. And if we're using SQL, you guys will see that are in the SQL class, we can sort our data really easily. We have sort methods that are available if we're using a list class. Why would we need to sort? Again, it's a matter of efficiency we might be able to sort our data in a more efficient manner than any of the built-in sorts. But we also need to know what the built-in sorts are doing so that we can kind of gut judge their level of efficiency. So here's one. This is a selection sort. Just like the selection search, this is kind of our basic sort. It's inefficient. We have to search the entire array to find the smallest value then move it to the first position in an array. In this lesson, we are going to show how the sorting algorithm selection sort works. I it think this is going to stick to me forever. The minimum element and when it is found, it will be moved in the first position. Repeat this procedure for the remaining elements, not including the element first sorted. The maximum number of comparison of this algorithm is by multiplying n for n minus 1 divided by 2, where n is the number of the elements. And now we are going to see how the algorithm works with a 3D animation. So as you see, the scary guy <laughs> is checking each item to see if it's less than the minimum. When he finally finds it. So notice he had to keep track of positions too, right? It wasn't just the number. And not to move it. So 
if you get this, the impression after you've been watching this one for a minute that it's going to take forever, that's the whole idea because this is a selection sort. And a selection sort is not efficient in any way, is it? He's going through and he's double checking in and things. At least he's not starting over at the beginning every time. I've seen programmers who code that way and they start over at the beginning of the array every single time. That could take a really long time. But he's still going to double check these last ones because he doesn't have any way to know that they're already in order. So finally, or finally in order. So our selection sort can be quite awesome. Take a really long time. So selection sort, very inefficient. Now an insertion sort is just a little bit different. In an insertion sort, we're comparing each item to the ones that are kind of like around it and deciding if we need to arrange rearrange them. So a little bit more efficient, but still not the most efficient. You want these to stick in your head forever? So we have our array up there, with all of our index values marked. And our first two dancers are going to compare each other to each other and decide if they need to swap. And he can't go any further, so he's good. Now, our second two are going to compare. Oh, yes, they need to swap. Do we need to swap them? Nope, we're good. Now, do we need to swap? Nah. To swap? Yep. Now, does she need to swap with any of those others? Oh, nope, we're good. So think about the code here. So we have a lot of different variables going. Still swap? Oh, yep. <laughs> well, there are a whole series of Romanian dancer sort videos available <laughs> on YouTube. <laughs> So if you are ever tired and cannot sleep, <laughs> you know what to do. They're going to get themselves into the right order here. So I just want you to be thinking about the code because somehow you're you're changing these index values to move around. They didn't have to swap. It's our last guy. I think that the Romanian men wear wear their skirts really well. <laughs> Don't they? They got little jingles on them. These are like redos. Their videos are so popular that I think they've redone some of them. Yay. And they actually, if you can see from the video, they, they actually spend quite a bit of time dancing and celebrating. So we'll stop that. <laughs> got themselves in order. So that's an insertion sort. So it does it in, you know, it wasn't as bad as that first selection sort, but it still could take a while. So how could we go faster? Well, we could do a merge sort. A merge sort is even more complicated in our code. We're kind of using a binary search algorithm. We're going to split the array into two arrays of equal size and sort each half and then merge them back together. Let's see what we got here. Oh yeah, it's that one guy. You can In see he does this one a lot faster. We are going to show how the sorting algorithm merge sort works. Its function is turned. 
divide the elements in the data structure into smaller partitions and sort them. Finally, must we merge the small partitions to make the original set with sorted elements? This strategy is called divide and conquer. The center are two sets, and just like traffic on the highway, we'll merge them together. Now, with, within the sorting of the individual elements, we could have some selection sort aspect or some insertion sort aspects, right? Because we could affect performance by what sort we choose for each half of the array or each part of the array. He's got that first half in order. And notice in his video that, that the two chunks were accidentally in order already. We would have to account for the possibilities there. That we would have to do a little bit more rearranging of those items. Now as he emerges, we take from two sets and decide what order. Because they should already be in order. So much faster, right? He was able to still take a little while there, but get everything in the right order in a much quicker manner. So that's a merge sort. Here's a really cool video. It's not gonna, I'm gonna go to YouTube because it won't let me make it in full screen. This is the one we want. There's lots of these out there. So this first one is a selection sort. You can see as we go through each item. Insertion sort, we are comparing side to side. And I go up and see how the data is getting released. This is a quick sort, so it's just a, a sort that kind of a merge sort, you can tell. It's doing like minor merges. Really fast. Here's another merge sort. So again, those intermediate sorts give us all sorts of different opportunities to enhance performance. Final merge is fast. Here's a heat sort, which is a Linux sort that you would see if you're running a sort at the Linux command line. Notice how they're starting at the top. This is also called a bubble sort, which is one that you have an opportunity to complete this week. Where our insertion sort kind of started at the, at the bottom of the array. Here's a radix sort. 
again, another Linux. It's super fast. So it's kind of a bucket sort is another name for that. Here's another one. We're kind of going through and allocating out the data into different buckets and then merging the different buckets. Very efficient. You can tell that they do a lot of bucket sorts, a lot of efficiency concerns. If I'm going to show my Linux distro is better than his Linux distro, I can make my sort faster. I'm almost done. No, wait, almost done. Here's the bubble sort. This is the kind that is one of the options for an assignment for you guys. This is the cocktail shaker sort. Again, a little bit of a merge, real fast though. This one is like the insertion sort, that second one we saw, but yet it effectively does it. Yeah, it does it in a really fast way. This is like a really interesting merge. I heard some ideas here. It's like a monster. And this is the BOGO story. I guess it's like like a sale at Payless. You could buy one and you could get one, but you can never get done or something. I don't know. It just never ever gets done. It just has a bug. It just keeps trying. So we don't want your code to be like that. <laughs> so don't be the bug of story. There's some really cool videos um, on YouTube. This one's really cool. That's all colors of sorting and things like that. So you can find some cool stuff. I like him. I like to pick, I like to visualize things. So it helps me a lot. That's what we're going to do with our activity here, but we'll probably have to wait till next time. So I mentioned it a couple of times in your assignment, you have a choice. But we're not really going to probably work on that assignment yet. Let's take a look at the things. And you can say, what are you trying to do to? So for week six, we have three assignments out here. And I want you to do two of them. You will, you're going to do that pig Latin one and not the one you should get started on. Because you should have all of the information already in your brain to do pig Latin, but you might have to do some researching on strings because we don't really do a lot with strings. And so there might be some string things that you'd like to enhance yourself with a little bit. 
What is Pig Latin? It's a string thing. It's awful. <laughs> so to convert from words to Pig Latin, you're going to be checking some things. If the string begins with a vowel, you'll add way to the end of it. So Pig Latin for orange would be orange way. Otherwise, you'll find the first occurrence of a vowel, move all the characters before the vowel to the end of the word and add a Y. For example, Pig Latin for story is oriste. So we move the ST to the end and add a Y. If there are no vowels, we add a Y. And here's our vowels, A, E, I, O, U, and Y. But of course, Y has to be a problem. And Y is considered a vowel only if it occurs before any of the other letters. And not as the first letter of a word. Huh? So Pig Latin for crystal is Isocre. But Pig Latin for yellow is Elucre. So if that makes sense, it doesn't count as a vowel if it's the first letter. So this example, this application could take you forever. I've seen people, I've seen people that have made it take forever. How could you make it not take forever? Wrong. <laughs> you can, you, you could letters of the word up in an array. You could do that. Are they already in an array because they're a yes. string? Yes. They are. But what, that's not what I'm looking for though. What am I looking for? What could you do before you started coding to get yourself situated to where you were ready to start coding? Learn huh? Learn no, well, yeah, you could learn. <laughs> but you could plan. You could plan how you're going to write this application first. So you could come up with some pseudocode or a hierarchy chart or an idea of what modules or what classes you're going to use. But if you come up with a plan and you know how to convert to Pig Latin based on your plan, then your code is going to be easy peasy, right? But if you just say, oh, I'm just going to start this, I'm going to write some code and I'm going to see where it takes me. I can tell you it's going to take you down a deep dark hole <laughs> and it's going to take you a lot longer than it will if you plan before you get started. This Pig Latin application for some reason is really like that. It can really start getting involved and spiral out of control if there isn't a lot of planning beforehand. But if there's planning, it can just be easy as pie. So just remember the plan. Now, the other assignments that we have if you can get this one to where you feel like you're having a good start, the other one is one of these two sorts. So either a bubble sort and a, or a bucket sort. Now these applications, all of these applications can be console apps, they can be Windows Forms apps. You write them however you want to write them. So that's totally up to you. When you're choosing whether you want to do your bubble sort or your bucket sort, here's my thinking. And you might not think the same way, but my thinking is, if you have the data structures class, you should pick the bucket sort because the bubble sort is kind of easy if you have the data structures class. But if you don't have the data structures class and you're maybe going to take that later or not take it, then you should pick the bubble sort, unless you really like to challenge yourself, in which case you should choose the bucket sort. So that would be my thinking. Data structures people should be bucket sort. Non-data structures people should do the bubble sort. And we'll look at those a lot more next time. So next time what we'll do is use all of our pieces of paper with our post-it notes. So you guys, you can put those in your backpacks or whatever you want to do, but let's keep them for next time because I don't want to touch them and I know we don't have germs going on or anything like that. But I still just want to be careful with it. Now, if you want to leave yours here, you can slide it under that table over there and just leave your post-it notes and stuff here in the room. But we'll take a look at those first things Wednesday. And then the rest of our time will be lab time.
to work on these applications. So we will have time. Yeah. 